Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Politics in the Pulpit, a lectionary-based preaching resource designed to ask the provocative questions of how politics could appear in our preaching this week. My name is Jackie Embry. I'm a newly retired United Reformed Church minister. I've worked in churches across Birmingham and Bolton and Salford, and as moderator of the United Reformed Churches Mersey Synod. I'm now living in Kendall on the edge of the Lake District. Each week I'm joined by a different guest, and today I'm very pleased to introduce Wendy Lloyd. Wendy lives and works on a croft on the Isle of Mull, on the west coast of Scotland. She's a spiritual director, pilgrim guide, and retreat facilitator under the name of her own fledgling project, Mull Another Way. She creates and curates worship with the Go, for Go Hell, an ecumenical Christian charity with over a hundred years experience in holistic healing and well-being. Wendy works in communications for the Iona community. She has a master's in Bible and contemporary world issues with a particular emphasis in the relationship between contemplation and activism. And we might get into that later, but Wendy, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for coming on this week's podcast. I'd like to ask to you know, start by asking you, do politics in the pulpit mix? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and I'll not be your first guest to have said that. Um, I also believe that the good news is for all of life. Um, I would say that I um, consider politics um, to be too important to remain in the pulpit um, for the preacher. Uh, I'm taken by um, a story that I heard once from um, a woman who I find very inspirational and will be thinking of International Women's Day in um, our, our reflections on the passages this week. Um, and one of the most impressive women I've met in my life is a woman called Suzanne Matali. And Suzanne was the chair of the Zambian Council of Churches. And in a previous role, I had the privilege of hosting her and taking her around Scotland to visit various churches and congregations to talk about her work. Um, and not only was she an ordained um, clergy person, she was also an activist for tax justice. Um, and when I met Suzanne for the first time, I took her for a coffee and we were just getting to know each other. And um, I was curious to know how she got into being um, such an activist for tax justice. She'd been involved in a campaign to make sure that the mining companies in Zambia, the copper mining in particular, uh, were paying what um, they were supposed to pay in, in terms of tax um, and, and therefore benefiting the um, Zambian economy and being able to provide more education and more health care and so on about how this clergy person had found herself in in such an activist role and she said uh, I I early in my my um, preaching career I suppose she said I I cannot preach from my pulpit while people are hungry in the pew she recognized that well she might give a really prophetic sermon, you know interweaving the political um, and and her preaching she realized she had to also be active in, in making sure the folk who were in her congregation were also getting what they needed um, in order to not just survive, but to, to thrive. So politics, absolutely in the pulpit, but not only in the pulpit, I would say. Sounds great. So just a few headlines um, that reflect our context at the moment. The UK government will announce the spring budget on Wednesday and a recent analysis from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation has concerns if there are tax cuts that they will negatively impact the poorest in society. Violence in Burkina Faso flared up last week with over 170 people executed in attacks in the north and attacks in a mosque and a church killing dozens more. Haiti is in a state of emergency after two of Haiti's biggest prisons were stormed by armed gangs, seeing thousands of inmates escape. This is part of wider and increasing violence and insecurity in Haiti. There have been talks in Cairo over the weekend about a potential ceasefire in Gaza. Hamas are expected to respond before next week. Kamala Harris, the US Vice President, called for an immediate ceasefire yesterday. And Gazans are suffering from starvation and hydration 
because not enough aid is getting to them. And some good news, a landmark law to reverse biodiversity loss in the EU has been approved by the European Parliament. Church-wise, this coming Sunday, the 11th of March, is the fourth Sunday in Lent, Mothering Sunday. On the 8th of March, it will be International Women's Day, and March is Women's History Month. The lectionary readings for Sunday, the 11th of March, are Numbers 21, 4 to 9, Ephesians 2, 1 to 10, John 3, 14 to 21, Psalm 107, 1 to 3, and 17 to 22. So, Wendy, where would you start with this week's readings? Thank you, Jackie. And just, I think it's the 10th of March, just in case that's something that confuses some folk. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no problem at all um just I, I was panicked for a second thinking oh I've got the wrong Sunday but I haven't it's the 10th um no problem at all so where would I start um I'm conscious that most of the folk I would expect who are listening to this are um thinking of a particular congregation in a particular context where they know the particular needs or issues or challenges in their context and I, I don't have that um, as my context. So when I come to preparing to preach, my, most of my preaching has been in a more itinerant capacity where I'm going into somewhere, you know, as a one-off to um, speak about issues of global justice or um, health and well-being and faith and so on. Um, so I feel a bit more distant from that kind of context. So the context you've just outlined with regards all these global concerns um, is certainly something I'm coming to these passages with. Um, and my other experience around preparing sermons is for um, in written form for the websites that I've um, various organizations I've worked for, so which removes you even further from that actual experience on a Sunday. So my starting point is always um, full of questions. Um, you know, what what is the point of, of need that this um, sermon or these sermons might helpfully meet. Um, and if, if we think about the violence, we think about all of these huge global issues, and then those domestic, yes, the budget being announced this week, those are the, how can so, what's said on Sunday, how can what's shared on Sunday, how can what's facilitated on Sunday help uh, folk navigate those and make sense of those life experiences um, rather than leaving those at the door? Um, and, and just very practically and pragmatically, um, aware of those things as they come to the text, but I'm also not wanting to force them in if they don't naturally fit. Um, I often use the phrase, um, you know, I if I have to do too much hermeneutical gymnastics, then it's possible that I'm forcing it a bit too much. So I, I'm aware of those things, but I'm not forcing those things. And, and then just even more practically, just looking at the passages from old through to um, new. Um, and so, you know, I start with the Numbers passage, I'll look at the Psalm, I'll look at Ephesians, and I'll look at John. Um, and I use the Vanderbilt Revised Common Lectionary more commonly than not. And so that's how it's laid out on one page. And so just taking a deep breath and reading my way through that, I have to confess that this week um, I've really got myself down the rabbit hole of numbers 21 um, but I can see as is the nature of the lectionary the synergy um, through the passages um, but this this numbers passage in particular I think it's primarily because it's Lent now I was brought up low church Protestant in Northern Ireland we did not do Lent far too Catholic um, I now work for two ecumenical Christian charities, so I've been on a journey. So Lent has become a really important moment year for my own personal devotion and faith. Um, and that's also really important as a, as a pilgrim guide, because uh, Lent and this numbers passage is particularly um, emphasising the will. Um, and I was quite taken in, in the bits of research and reading that I did, and I'm just going to make sure I get the pronunciation of this correct. Um, the Hebrew name for the book of Numbers is Be Bemidbar. You'll, you can tell that's not familiar to me, Bemidbar. Um, but 
means in the desert. So this numbers as a name doesn't capture my imagination. I'm, I'm more inclined to stories than stats. But Bed, can't even pronounce it, Bed Midbar, in the desert, the wilderness wanderings of a people is something that is close to my heart, given that I live on the Isle of Mull. Um, it's, you know, regarded as one of these wonderful wild places in the UK, if not in Europe. Um, it's a destination because of the wildness. Um, and I guide people on what I call wilderness pilgrimages. Um, and wilderness works as, as metaphor as well as, as literal. Um, and I think in this passage, we have the experience of both. Um, and it's not difficult, I think, to do a bit of a, a hop, skip and a jump into, well, there's been, we've been living in a wilderness of austerity um, across these um, nations of the United Kingdom, you know, 14 plus years. Um, we're facing a budget again that's suggesting that's going to continue, if not deepen. Um, so there's parallels there, I think, which of wilderness in this season of, of spiritual wilderness of, of Lent. That's why it's drawn me in a bit more um, than the other passages. Um, and, I, and I'm in my context particularly interested in what our relationship is as creature, as humanity with other creatures. And so here, as in various other places in the Bible, we have this difficult relationship with snakes, with serpents. Yeah. Um, and I, and again, you know, thinking about International Women's Day coming up and there's that particular story in Genesis around the women and the snake having enmity against each other or with each other. Um, and, and here I'm just maybe stretching that a bit too far, but it, it got me curious about that conversation relationship the woman had with the snake. There was a, an intimacy with creation there that was broken and was lost. Um, and how that story has been um, used in such a way as to, I think, oppress women, particularly in the church, um, regarded as the source and cause of the fall. Um, so there's a difficult, difficult question in there around um, if we are to be celebrating women, raising women up, um, as International Women's Day does, is maybe if we are to go down the snake and the women theme, thinking carefully about how we can restore um, and recognize that at that moment or in that story being told that um, there was a brokenness of a relationship between creatures. Um, and can we get back to a place of connection with creatures in such a way as all of life can flourish? Um, you know, that good news story around biodiversity in Europe this week, um, I read also read a story um, of a, a, a new anaconda, so a new snake that was found in the Amazon this week, um, a giant anaconda, which will terrify some people. But even that terrifying find a creature that's also talked about and crafty. You know, the disciples are sent out to be as wise as serpents. So is there redemption in this story for the snake and for women and how they're regarded? I think there could be, um, if, if that was a train of thought that, that folk wanted to explore and take further. Um, in this particular story in Numbers, um, there's some other really questions. I think particularly of the verse six in this passage. So in verse six, we're told that um, the Lord sent serpents among the people and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. And that's not a comfortable verse at all to read. Um, and it, in many ways, it reminds me of, you know, referring to my low church Protestant upbringing in Ireland, where the God that we were introduced to was more a God of wrath than a God of condemnation than a God of love. And in this, you know, had this passage been preached to, you know, in a way that I remembered it, and I doubt that it was, it's not a passage that's probably that popular, much easier to go with John 3, 16, that we all know and, you know, can, can cite by memory from when we're knee high to a grasshopper, particularly in my upbringing. But the, there's an uncomfortable, do we just ignore that the Lord sent the serpents or do we wrestle with 
the context that that's written in and the reality that, well, the Bible is a God of wrath. But in my coming to this and reading it alongside the particular, the reference to um, this passage by Jesus himself in John 3, is it's the lifting up. It's the source and means of redemption, the grace and the mercy that we are drawn to by Jesus, who was more than familiar with this story. So there's uncomfortable questions that I'm coming to, and I don't want to ignore those. And whether they would be helpful and appropriate in, in a church context where you know the folk um, that would be comfortable to, to, um, to sit with those questions or not is, is up to the discernment, I guess, of the preacher. Um, I, I rather am drawn more um, I'm drawn to a lot, as you can tell within it. it in terms of the, the reason it seems that these snakes appear in this passage. Now, someone has pointed out there isn't a, actually a direct correlation between verse five and verse six. So the people spoke against God and they spoke against Moses. Plain. And then the Lord sent snakes. It doesn't say because they complained that the Lord sent the snakes. And I, it's a nuance. It's difficult maybe to explain it away that with that, but it's an interesting, interesting idea. And I, you know, think about again the pilgrim guiding here on Mull. You know, when I give my safety talk to folk at the start of the walk, I um walk through, you know, sticking together, not you know, the mist and fog coming down, you make sure you're not spread out too much, walk at the pace of the slowest person, all of those essential things, but also have to mention the fact that there are adders. On mull there are snakes on mull um and uh, you know my advice avoid, avoid avoid but if you do get bitten stop 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 and so i guess i'm thinking about that because this is the wilderness the people are in the wilderness there are snakes so it has the lord sent them or are they just there maybe you know they've set up camp in a place where there's a disproportionate number of snakes um and so you know they maybe put a tent peg through one of them and it's made them angry. And so they're defense. Just maybe just again, nudging back to that. What is our relationship with and as creatures with each other? Now, the, the interpretation of the word snake in this would suggest that possibly even have a, a heavenly character. There's a reference across to Isaiah 6, similar language. Um, so I wouldn't want to stretch that too far, but um, it at least again helps us enter back into this is the wilderness. This is not the natural habitat for folk um, who are, you know, more inclined to having water supply that's readily available, having food supply on ground that's more fertile to grow food on. So they're out of their comfort zone massively. But the reason that they are in this situation in terms of the complaining that they're giving to God and to Moses, looking back to the very start of the passage, is to do with their impatience. Mm -hmm. and, I, and in the context of thinking about the political and the activist, it's our impatience that so often mobilizes us to take action. Yeah. It's our impatience that causes us to call out to um, speak out against and I suppose the question in there where's the where's the line what's the fine line maybe between speaking and grumbling and complaining I think it's to do with where that's orientated so the grumbling and complaining in this passage is very much about our needs our discomfort our lack of food our lack of water and the grumbling and complaining that converts into speaking out against injustice is collective well-being and our collective flourishing. And um, when we're calling for a ceasefire for those who are seeing starving in Gaza because they don't have food, it's not that it's our needs that are being met. It's that we want collectively our needs to be met. So there's some patience in this passage that I think can inform how we operate how we operate as activists in the world. Um, and I'm also particularly taken by that in this case, their grumbling and complaining is not just directed towards Moses, 
yeah. previous examples of this in Exodus and Numbers is that they were grumbling, but they grumbled at Moses and Aaron. And then they took the grumblings to God and said, look, they're giving us a hard time. Can you not do something? Um, in this case, they're also grumbling and complaining against God. And it got me thinking about the place of grumbling and complaining towards God. Um, and is there a place for that, even in our being active in the world? Um, and I think there is, but and I'm thinking here particularly of the practice of lament and the importance of lament. Um, you know, our hearts are broken and should be broken as we look at and look towards the pain of what's happening in Gaza, as we hear about the seeming chaos of what's happening in Haiti, um, the violence in Burkina Faso. Those are those are things that grieve us when we choose to look towards them. And that choosing to look towards, I think, is also really important in this passage. And we'll come to that in a, in a bit. Um, but the, the way in which we take that grief and we take that heartache to God, as well as into our protest and our calls for change to those in political power, is, is that we join our hearts in God's heartache. We don't complain against God as the cause. We go to God with our, our heartache because God's heart aches too. Um, and so you know, I, one of my favorite um, quotes in this uh, area, and I'll, let me again just find it so I'm not misquoting, uh, is from Walter Brueggemann, um, where he says that uh, to lament is to protest so deep that it must become a prayer for only God can provide the needed hope that justice will prevail and that the future will be different. So I'd, I'd suggest in you know this wilderness of austerity, in this wilderness of violence and conflict across the world, in all of these uncomfortable, painful places, that rather than blaming a divine other, we go with our heartache to God in lament. And I, I think that's really, really important um, as activists to keep on keeping on in the journey towards justice. Uh, in my work with Go Health, um, I've just recently curated and created a series on burnout and, and you know, conscious of burnout being across lots of different areas of life. Um, but thinking particularly around burnout for activists of if I if if I was just to do this on my strength or on our human strengths alone, I would have given up years and years ago. I have got to believe in the will and way of God at work in the world. And I do get impatient to see it at work as active as I would like. And then I realize I am God's hands and feet here on earth now. But together, God help. And so prayer as an activist is really, really incredibly important. It's that contemplation and action um, that we see symbolized in the Iona community as well with um, the cat and the monkey. So in the actual abbey on Iona, there is a, a carving of a cat and a carving of a monkey. And that's often referred to in the community's life as being the, the balance between our contemplation and our activism. So in the place of prayer with God, um, where we can take our sadness and our grief and our protest that energizes us then to channel that complaint and grumbling to where it should be channeled in our call for justice, for equality, for peace. Um, so, so lament, I think, uh, rather than that impatience being directed towards our own I think is really really key i just want to there's one other thing in in there um that i i think is important to to flag up or to highlight around i suppose it's again going back to lent as being this season of reflection and renewal um there's something about this passage being really disruptive um as to the learned behavior of the, the israelites so they were impatient, they grumbled and complained towards God, and they didn't get what they wanted. And that's not the usual pattern for these folk. So, you know, we've, we've got stories prior to this one where 
Now, they complained of no water. And Moses is told by God to strike the rock and the water comes gushing forth. Um, they're told that, um, or they complain they don't have any food and they get manna from heaven on a daily basis. Um, they complain of not having any meat and the quails rise from the earth. So they're, they're, every time they complain, they've got what they've wanted. Um, and so there's something in this passage where it's disrupted as a pattern of learned behavior. Um, and I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just noticing that, not suggesting um, that again, that it's a consequence that God sent the snakes. There's things that are uncomfortable in that for, for me just to accept, but there is something having to disrupt their um, inclination towards complaint. Uh, and, and I guess something in that that makes me feel the disappointment of God, where they've, they've, um, they've had their liberation, they have from Egypt, they have had their, um, their profound covenant relationship with God at Sinai. And yet they're focusing on these important for sure to have food and water absolutely but they do have food they're just complaining about the nature of it and so there's something of the disappointment of God in this that I sense um maybe something that echoes that shared heartache with with God that causes us to lament as I said earlier when Jesus refers to this passage he refers to it with the, the end in mind. So with, uh, as Moses lifted up the serpent um, in, the snake, uh, in the desert, so the son of man will be lifted up. And that's, some people say, well, this numbers passage is only in the lectionary because Jesus mentioned it. And I would say, well, Jesus mentioned it. This is a passage that Jesus knew and looked to. And so there's, there's importance in here for us as with all of scripture, but there's particular importance in this. Um, and, and it's that part of the passage. So if I'm uncomfortable with verse six, but I don't want to ignore it, I want to recognize that it's there, whether my congregation or the context that I'm preaching wrestle with it in the same way, that's, that's for, for folk to discern. But if there's any part of this passage, it's this lifting up of the serpent. Um, and, and as you know, I talked about the connection with creation, the snakes as part of creation, the you know, the, the what craftiness of snakes, as well as this poisonous, um, you know, what is that phrase? Uh, one man's or one person's poison is another person's medicine. Um, there's, there's this kind of portrayal of snakes throughout the Bible um, that, that shed, they shed their skin literally, but also, you know, sometimes the skin is negative, sometimes it's positive, it's there's, a, there's an interesting thread throughout. Um, and, and, you know, the reality is snakes exist. Snakes just happen. Um, but it's that they become the source of healing that I think is particularly interesting. Um, he, Jesus, um, when he's referring to Moses lifting up the snake in the desert, he's referring to his own being lifted up as a source um, of God's love for the world um and so for us to look towards the source of pain as is the case in the numbers passage and for us to look towards the brokenness of Christ's body on the cross as a source of healing just doesn't really add up it doesn't really make sense and yet as I think about the journey of some activists that I know, they are mobilized to take action in those particular issues because there's so many issues. How do you choose? How do you choose where to invest your energy and your time and your passion? You know, I often think with the Iona community where we have nine common concern networks, as we call them. So if you're committed to peace and justice, you join the peace um, common concern network. If you're committed to um, Peace in Israel, Palestine, you've got Israel, Gaza, we've got poverty, LGBTQ, um, spirituality. There's all of these areas of particular passion and interest. They're all really worthy. So, how do you choose which and where? 
And there's something in that source of healing being in what has caused the pain or is painful, I think that is often something that catalyzes us to um, be active in that area in the world. Um, so I, I suppose my own story of, of having the privilege of gone, going to be with folk in Uganda in my early 20s, um, locking eyes with folk who I knew their life expectancy would be far reduced from mine purely because of where they lived, purely because of where they were born. Something in that experience really formed me, really um, captured my heart such that when I came back and I taught geography for a number of years, I taught development as a topic within geography and I never taught any, you know, rivers, earthquakes, volcanoes, all lovely, but development, when it came to that, because I had some lived play in the same way, but I had at least been exposed to and experienced something of the, the palpable injustice that geography would determine someone's length of life. It, it put a fire in my belly, as opposed to use a phrase, um, that drove me so I, it was in turning towards pain that I was then able to be more active in um, educating and forming raising awareness so others and myself included could do something potentially about that um you know I had young people who went through um some of those classes who've gone on to be very working with the UN and working with the Quakers to to mobilize. um there's something about not turning away from pain, not turning away from brokenness, that either is because of our own lived experience or because we've really faced up to what breaks our hearts, that we really then want to be involved in whatever we can do and be as a solution to pain in the world. So looking towards um, the snake seems very counterintuitive. That's the thing that killed those we love. And yet it's in that looking towards pain, looking towards suffering, we find something that is healing. And it reminds me of that um, well-known idea of Henry Nyons of the wounded healer. You know, the none of us fixed and sorted in our work to bring peace and justice to the world. We recognize that we, you know, we, we, um, we campaign with a limp. Um, we walk with a limp. Um, if if we're we're able to do so, um, so and I, I think as well the the, the significance of Jesus ref, making that direct parallel, recognizing his own pain, his own suffering, his own broken body, um, that for those of you, those of us who are in pain, who have lost loved ones in the desert, who are losing loved ones in Gaza, um, and if I dare even try to imagine the horror of that that it's as um, Dr. Minther Isaac preached and, um, at Christmas, it's Christ is in the rubble. Christ is on the cross and is in this place of peace and the solidarity of that. And as we look towards the cross in this wilderness experience of Lent, we look towards the, the healing, um, the comfort, um, the presence of God with us in suffering, not absent, but very much in the place of pain with us. And that may bring some comfort, but we need more than comfort in these difficult times. And of one more thing, <laughs> and this is what will take us through the other passages as well. I think um, mentioned the John passage a few times in reference to that first verse um, within a conversation with Nicodemus that Jesus has. But this theme of, of rising up um, that, that Moses does with the, the rod and the snake. Um, and folk will be familiar with that as a medical symbol as well, of the snake um, around the rod, uh, which I haven't done a little bit of research, was that that became the medical symbol because of this passage. It didn't. It's a, it's around Greek mythology. Uh, I was a wee bit disappointed, but that's still you know valid and, and interesting, the cultural connections there as well. Um, but the, the, that is healing, you know, and what a what an incredible curious image to have the snake around the rod as, as a medical symbol to this day um, as a source of healing. Uh, the rising up thing I think is, is a really rich theme as well as we think of International Women's Day. 
um, the theme for International Women's Day this year is um, in inspiring inclusion. Um, so we have it there in, in numbers, we have it in the John passage, and then we also have it in the Ephesians passage. And in the Ephesians passage, I think, is particularly inclusive because it talks about um, by, by grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So there's a, it's not just the snake, it's not just Jesus in a solitary way, it's the rising up, the raising up of us with Jesus, um, that being with. Um, so I, I, I love the, uh, the theme and the idea of how do we raise up these wonderful women, celebrate women across the world, women who have been sources of healing in the world, women like Suzanne Matali, who I mentioned earlier, who have been active for justice, who have been recognized the pain of the people in her pews and has gone into the place of pain in order to help bring about the change that is needed. Uh, you know, the women such as Sheila Cassidy, who is a, a long inspiration of mine, um, who I, you know, whose writings I dip into regularly as a, as a person who suffered pain in the place of torture in Chile. And, to this day, source of inspiration and healing, not only in her work as a medical doctor in the past, but also in, in how she she um, empathizes and she, um, stories of folk who have overcome. Um, so raising up women, not just across um, uh, in the Bible, but in our world and in our lives um, as an inspiration for overcoming struggle and overcoming pain in the world. Um, so there's something in that that metaphor as well that I would be be interested to explore, and always the question in there is, as well as are the women present? And and in these passages, there there is no explicit reference to women. There are is inclusion in, in reference to all people in the in the numbers passage. But that's always an interesting, you know, what hymns do we choose? What prayers do we um, draw from? And maybe on on a Sunday that's mother both Mother's Day. Um, and just after International Women's Day and in Women's History Month, as you've mentioned as well, um, we can make sure to to make sure women are present in our pulpit pews and in our worship as a whole. Wendy, those are a few you. of the starters. <laughs> those those are great. I mean, thank you very much indeed. I, I haven't interrupted simply because I've been so fascinated by what you've been saying. And I think you will have inspired a lot of people. Um, so thank you very much indeed. Um, and, and thank you to the rest of you for joining us to ask whether or how we should preach politics from the pulpit this week. If you've enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review wherever you listen to your podcasts and share this episode with your friends. We also have online spaces for further engagement and discussion about faith and politics on X or Twitter at public issues or using hashtag politics in the pulpit. We have a Facebook group, which you can access through the Joint Public Issues Team's Facebook page and the website JPIT UK, that's J-P-I-T dot UK. So let's go both into our politics and our pulpits with a prayer based on the URC's prayer handbook for 2021, written by Nadine Snyman. God of grace, thank you that we can live in Christ, that the gift of life you offer us is free. We do not have to work to be loved. As tempting as it is to try to prove our worth to you, you love us simply because we are yours. Your grace is what saves us, not our own strivings. God of grace, sometimes we tire of trying too hard. Help us hear your gentle words. I love you and let that be enough for our hearts. You created us for good. May our actions flow from your grace. And may all things that we attempt to do be good in your eyes. Amen.